From that day forward, I vowed two things. One, that I would never again have a failing business venture. And two, I would exact my revenge from the guy that ripped me off. What kind of business was it? The Larry Storch School of Heating and Air Conditioning Repair. Larry Storch is in the house. Hit the deck. Now, Greg Itzen, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm originally um, from Wisconsin, the Midwest. I've been out in Los Angeles a little over a year. I'm a teacher and a novice writer, and I'm getting married in about three weeks. Well, good for you. Thank Are you. you currently employed? Uh, no, not right now. Uh -huh. I came down to L.A. to do some writing, and I so see. right now I'm not. And to win some money on... Yeah. My name is Brian, a.k.a. your favorite dog. Hey, whose leg do you got a gagoosh to get an amaretto di serrano around here? Rest in peace, Larry Storch, Gregory Itzen, Tony Sirico, and Adam Wade. Next on CBS Sports, Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the dregs of humanity. Episode 287, submission number 1335, the 1990 MLB All-Star Game. The 1990 MLB All-Star Game aired on CBS on July 10th, 1990. Well, if only Brent hadn't been fired three months earlier, we could have actually had him say you're watching the Major League Baseball All-Star Game on CBS. You're you watching see, the Major League Baseball All-Star Game on CBS. See what I'm doing? I'm doing the Kevin Neal on his Brent holding the eyelids. <laughs> Never gets old. No. Never gets old. Nope. Well, remember... When we talked earlier back in January about CBS Sports 90, the dream season, we purposely skipped this over because we knew we were covering this in the summer. So, OK, it's 1990, the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. The 61st edition is being held at Wrigley Field in Chicago, Illinois. And this is the first time that Wrigley Field has had the All-Star Game since they installed lights at Wrigley Field two years earlier. Some would say that it was a sacrilege. Some would say it was a benefit. I am firmly in the camp of the latter. Wrigley Field never looked better until you've seen Wrigley Field under the lights. It looks nice. It looks sexy. See, Timothy Chalamet agrees with me. So, yes, this, this would have been the third year of Chicago baseball under the lights. And it would be baseball's greatest showcase with some of the greatest people of the era, including in his rookie debut, if I'm not mistaken, one, my personal favorite of all time, Ken Griffey Jr. Second oh, yeah. year. Second, Second year. year. Okay. Yeah, because the big thing in 89 would have been his uh, rookie card from Upper Deck. His, yeah, the card number one, literally. The, f the first card kind of sort of ever made by Upper Deck. Well, the first card in the first official set they made, yeah. In 89, yeah. But yeah, his first appearance in the All-Star Game, and that was the year I think him and uh, Griffey Sr. went back-to-back -back in one game. Mm -hmm. That was a great moment. But okay, 1990, okay, we got the uh, A's just running high off their 89 championship. Yeah. We got Roger Craig managing the National League for the uh, San Francisco Giants. And of course, Tony Orusa managing from Oakland for the American League. And even though it's not really. He is kind of a homecoming in Chicago because he did manage the White Sox. 
We talked about that previously. That's right. In um, Disco Demolition Night, even though we found out after that he wasn't the manager yet of the White Sox. Th- that wasn't right. even the answer I was asking for. But to tell the truth. I was talking 80, about to, yeah. tell, to tell the truth 1980. Yes. Yeah, because he was a subject in To Tell the Truth 80. So. <laughs> Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Tony LaRusso. Number two. My name is Tony LaRusso. And number three. My name is Tony LaRusso. Only one of these people is the real Tony LaRusso and has sworn to tell the truth. Okay, guys, I was watching some of the pregame show of this on YouTube earlier in the week. And they had, like, because... As we know, it was a rainy night in Chicago. They had the tarp out and everything before the game. And um, they had some clips of the pregame show of, like, Pat O'Brien in the stands at Wrigley Field in the bleachers. And do you know who was right next to him in one segment, guys? Who was right next to him in one segment, Greg? The catcher of the Chicago Cubs back in 1990, Joe Girardi. Ah, I remember seeing that picture. Yes. This was 25 years B.Y. before Yankees. Well, no, no. 19 years before Yankees when he won the championship Ah. in 09. But he did win like three championships with the Yankees as a player. But guys, we got to mention, he was recently a victim of the great takeout business in Philadelphia. Oh, no. Not the takeout business. Oh, that great takeout business. Philly's ownership took him out. Oh, takeout business? Yeah, we got a good takeout business. Takeout business. This is what happens when you blow an 8 1 9 fitting lead to the Mets. I didn't hear you complaining. Well, no, but still. Well, but also remember what happened after he got fired. Didn't the Phillies win, like, the next eight or nine in a row? Yeah, that's right, because Joe Girardi didn't have that. They, the new manager didn't have that stupid thing Girardi does where he doesn't pitch a guy, like, three straight days or whatever. I don't get it, but whatever. Okay, but, guys, let's talk about the uh, intro to this Major League Baseball All-Star Game on CBS. Yes, this was a really, really good piece of work here. Of course, it came at a time where everybody was doing everything very... It's like everything on television had to be an art house movie, almost, and this intro was no exception. Where we had uh, the first ever All-Star Game in Chicago. They were just basically... I think it was Arch Gray was basically going over how it was going to work. Arch, you put me on about this game. Think I'm crazy? Yeah, I do. Can't you see it, Frank? The best in the American against the best in the national. It'll be great. But, Arch, the game don't come for nothing. Will to the fans. Good night, Mr. Ward. Good night, Andy. We'll see. There's a ball inside. Say, do you think Arch Ward ever dreamed it would turn out like this? Someday you'll play this game, son. Someday we'll all play this game, together. Boys and girls, this boy Hubble is a pitcher. Here it is. Quick three. Quick three. He's up. There's a high drive going deep, deep. It is a home run. Come on, Ernie. Big stick. Big stick, Ernie. Come on. Come on, Ernie. Your hip brings up to you to the right. Come on. Good afternoon, Frank. Hey, Mr. Ward. Looks like you're a genius. Save it, Frank. Give it to me in 50 years if we're still around. <laughs> hey, who's going to win that game tomorrow? Remember? It don't count for nothing. Yeah, sure. Rose is coming to the plate. Throws the throw. It's all over. The National League win. I always 
Pirates had fun at Wrigley Field. That's a fly ball deep to left. Fox, Fox, hey, hey, he did it! Look, Grandpa. Great catch tomorrow. You know, I never thought I'd say this. It's a beautiful night for baseball. Let's play, too. And then you flash forward to uh, 16 years later, where we have another All-Star game. And in the crowds, you see an African-American father and his son. Yeah. And also we see some of the great history of the All-Star game. Carl Hubble of the New York Giants striking out a couple of... uh, People from the American League, five Hall of Famers in a row. Ted Williams winning the All-Star game in uh, 46. Jackie Robinson making his debut in the All-Star game in 49. And then you see more history. Pete Rose in, uh, what I want to say it was 77? 1970, where he rolled over Ray Fossey to win the All-Star game for the National League. Um, Reggie Jackson's towering home run in 71 with Oakland and the year before at 89 with Bo Jackson. Bo knows baseball. Run. Bo knows baseball in the 89 All-Star game. And then we get this little girl skipping with her grandfather. And a foul ball comes flying out of Wrigley Field. And everybody's going for it, but the little girl ultimately grabs it. And gives it to her grandfather. And who should her grandfather be but Mr. Cub himself, Ernie Banks? Wow. That's amazing. But Chico, I have one question. Yes. <laughs> Where's the dip? Where's the dip? I knew that was coming. Because according to Henry Warnemont. You're not a true friend of Ernie Banks until... He asked you, where's the dip? How did you and Ernie get to be buddies? In 1962, I photographed the wedding of Ernie's second cousin. (laughs) And that made you buddies? Absolutely. I walked up to him and said, some wedding, huh? And Ernie smiled back at me and said, where's the dip? I showed him where the dip was, gangway. Hey, it's a beautiful day. We got the sunshine. We got fresh air. We got the fans behind us. So, oh, let's yeah. play too. Let's play too. And one note I want to mention, Ernie Banks actually threw out the first pitch with his granddaughter with him. So, following the... Uh, End of the promo, I guess, in the uh, beginning leading up to the start of the broadcast for the 1990 MLB All-Star Game. So, there you go. Great continuity there. Let's go over, shall we, the um, the starters and the reserves and all the pitchers for the American and National League, shall we? Okay. Yeah, and all of these names would go on to become legendary. Well, most of these names. And there would be one name that would be legendary twice. You'll see what we're talking about in a moment. Okay, but well, let's talk about the coaching stats. I mentioned Tony Orusa for the A's for the American League. For the assistant coaches, we have from the Chicago White Sox, because, of course, the game's in Chicago, Jeff Torborg. We have from the Baltimore Orioles, Frank Robinson. And... Hey, Mike, I think we talked about this guy in the MLB versus Celebrity softball game from the Seattle Mariners. Jim Lefevre? Yeah, Jim Lefevre. Did we? Yeah, I think we did. I know we talked about Jim Fergosi. I didn't know. Uh, no. We did, uh, oh, in the softball game. I thought you were talking about last week's episode. Yeah. yeah, we did talk about him in the softball game. You're right. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, he was managing Seattle at the time, so. And for the National League, I mentioned Roger Craig from the Giants. But, okay, the assistant coaches, we got Jim Leland from the Pittsburgh Pirates and from the Chicago Cubs. Oh, Don Zimmer. 
What more needs to be said about Don Zimmer? He's a legend. He really oh, is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. May not have been a great player, but he is a, a heck of a coach. He was a heck, heck of, of a personality. Coach. Oh, yeah. I think he'll always be best known, sadly, for when he and uh, Pedro got involved in that brouhaha in the ALCS in 03. But, yeah, I mean, one of the great coaches of all time. So, respect the legend, Don Zimmer, RIP, we miss you. But, okay, let's go into the starter, shall we? Yep. Starting for the AL, we have at pitcher Bob Welch. His second All Star game, and I think he, what I think uh, he had a great year in '90 on the mound. I think for Oakland, right? Well, he won yeah. Cy Young, and I th- want to say he won 25 games. It, it was by far one of his best years, if not his best. Okay, oh, definitely, definitely. And a catcher from the Cleveland Indians, Sandy Alomar Jr., making his debut, his of year. course. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he'd he'd win uh, MVP, I think, in uh, 97. That's right. Which was, yeah, Progressive Field here in Cleveland, yeah. And then uh, at first base, we got... uh, Now, Chico, you have some words to say about this. I do have some words to say about this. From the Oakland Athletics, his fourth All-Star game, one half of the Bash Brothers, Mark McGuire. And all I can say is... Mark McGuire without a mustache is just weird looking. Yeah, he was definitely not practicing his Italian back in 1990. No, no, he was not. Boy, you know, I've always wanted to come in here. And now that I got a mustache, the timing feels right. Wow, all this stuff looks pretty good. Uh, can we get some salami and... Brian, Brian, let me handle this. Uh, scusi, babba da boopy. Che cosa? Peter, what are you doing? Speaking Italian. Babba da boopy. Peter, you can't speak Italian just because you have a mustache. Okay, and then at second base from the New York Yankees in his fifth All-Star game, we have the man who committed so many unsolved murders in New York City, Steve <laughs> Sachs. And, and we'll actually talk about him next year, believe it or not. What? I did not realize this. He was a celebrity on Just Men. Oh, yes. Uh, he was on Just Men because he would have been with the Dodgers, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he would have won Rookie of the Year in 82, I believe. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Oh, you know Dusty Baker was also on Just Men? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Yeah. So we'll be talking about Steve Sachs and Dusty Baker this time uh, in January, six months from now. So that'll be awesome. But okay, at third base. At third base? From the Boston Red Sox in his sixth All-Star game, Wade Boggs. And, you know, not much to say, but 64 beers. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. Uh, one of the great episodes of It's Always Sunny, The Gang Beats Boggs, hey, well, and then, and then the, the women's reboot. Oh, the Bo- Gang Beats Boggs ladies reboot. Frank, Feminist AF. <laughs> feminist uh. AF! <laughs> but Boggs' cameo on that episode of It's Always Sunny is one of the great cameos ever. Where Charlie thinks he's dead. Hello, Charlie. Oh, shit. you're the ghost of Wade Boggs. I'm not a ghost, Charlie. You're just hallucinating. You had over 30 beers, dude. Uh, you did? Nice, man. You know your friend Mac is right. Oh, yeah? I didn't win five batting titles because it was fun. Right. I won it because I wanted to be the best. Do you see what I'm saying? No, nah, not really, man. There's nothing more fun than winning. So come on, drink up. I'll have one with you. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it, All guys. Right. Let's drink. Cheers. But okay, at shortstop from the Baltimore Orioles in his eighth All Star game, Cal Ripken Jr. The Iron Man. That's right. He would be what five years away from breaking the uh, consecutive games record. But that, I, I think that was like a. Yeah. Um, 
a big thing. Like he was getting close to that record at this time. He was within reach. Yeah. I mean, it was 95 that he uh, eventually broke it. Yeah. But okay. The outfield, we mentioned Ken Griffey Jr. Mm -hmm. And also we got from the Oakland A's. Jose Canseco, the other past brother, this four fall star game. And of course, I think last week we mentioned the uh, the moment with the Texas Rangers against the Indians where the ball went off his head. Yes. yes yeah, we, we, we mentioned that. Yes. Also, one cool moment as Jose Canseco is being introduced to the crowd at Wrigley Field is the CBS cameraman cuts to a shot of a window at Wrigleyville with a sign that says 455 feet, and underneath it, there's a sign that says Jose, with the O being the CBS I, which is a clever touch, and hopefully that will be the alternate cover art for this episode, because that is pretty awesome, the Jose sign with the CBS I in place of the O. But it is ninth All-Star appearance from the Oakland A's, Ricky Henderson. Wow, Ricky Henderson. And I think um, he broke the American League record for stolen bases this year in um, 90. Yep. And the following year, he'd break the uh, record by Lou Brock for both stolen bases in 91. So, Also, wasn't he your MVP in 1990? Uh, I got to look. I wouldn't be surprised if he was the MVP in 1990. Hold on a second. Yeah, Ricky Henderson was the 1990 MVP for the American League. Henderson in 90 tied a career-high 28 home runs and recorded 61 RBI for a 90 Oakland team that won 103 regular season games. So that was great. Okay, so now let's go over the starters for the National League. From the Cincinnati Reds, the starting pitcher, Jack Armstrong. In his first All-Star game. Yeah, let me try to get his stats from 90 real quick. Because, of course, this was the year the Reds went to the World Series in uh, 90 against the uh, A's, as we talked yeah, about. Yeah, I know. They, Just, swept the, they swept the A's. Just 12 and 9. I was sad. 12 and 9 in 90? Yeah, just 12 and 9. He must have had, like, a Jacob deGrom-type season if he got uh, named the starter then. Well, you got to remember, Cincy was well. Well, well what I, happened with Cincy that year? They they ended up winning the World Series, but they were like the the, the I don't want to say like the underdog team, but yeah, I mean they sort of came out of nowhere in in ninety uh, and shocked the baseball world. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, he won eight of his first nine starts, and all of them were before the All Star game. So his career record forty and sixty five. Played with Cleveland for a year in 92. Played with the... Oh, he was with the expansion Marlins in 93. He was 9-17, and 17, and he finished his career with Texas in 94. So, only about six years. So, this was his only All-Star appearance, but this was his one shining moment. No, wait, that's another thing on CBS. That's, yeah, that's another thing on TV. Okay. At catcher from the LA Dodgers, in his second All-Star game, Mike Sosha. Will I be able to play softball tomorrow? <laughs> but tomorrow, you won't even be alive. Oh, man. And the hilarious thing was years later, he was on The Simpsons again when he was the manager of the Angels. So he's been on The Simpsons twice at first base from the San Francisco Giants in his third All-Star game, Will the Thrill Clark. One of the big superstars of the late 80s, early 90s. Oh, man. Will Clark, if you didn't have his poster hanging up somewhere in 1989 or 1990, what was wrong with you? Yeah, he was second. In 89, to Tony Gwynn in the batting title race. Okay. But at second base, okay, guys, from the hometown Chicago Cubs, in his seventh All-Star game, Ryan Sandberg. 
home crowd favorite, and, well, one of the all-time legendary second basemen. And, Chico, we did talk about him in the Punky Brewster goes to the NLCS episode in 84. Yes, we did. He was, he was, he was one of the uh, pros that Punky and Henry met. That's right. And he had that famous uh, game where he hit the two home runs off Bruce Suter on the NBC Game of the Week mm-hmm. in 84. A legendary moment. You might even say that that game made his career like Wings made Tony Shalhoub's career. Just as long as Ryan Sandberg did not have a boat in a bottle that was destroyed under mysterious circumstances. Okay, at third base from the Cincinnati Reds in his second All-Star game, Chris Sabo. And yep. really, one of the most iconic players of his era with the goggles. And would you believe he is currently the head baseball coach at the University of Akron? And oh. he and? and he frequents Akron Rubber Ducks games. I've heard friends say they've gotten his autograph at, at Rubber Ducks games. Oh wow. Yeah. Really nice guy from what I've heard. Okay, that's awesome. Okay. And at shortstop from the St. Louis Cardinals in his 10th All-Star game, the Wizard of Oz, Ozzy Smith. I'll tell you right now, 262 lifetime batting average, 28 homers, 793 ribeyes, 15 total All-Stars, 13 total gold gloves, one Silver Slugger, one Roberto Clemente Award. And one son who was a contestant on American Idol. That's right. His son was on American Idol one season. I forgot about that. But okay, for the outfield for the National League, we got from the Chicago Cubs in his seventh All-Star Game appearance, Andre Dawson. The Hawk. (laughs) And of course, who could forget that legendary State Farm commercial where Kerry Wood pulled him out, and he asked in the style of Dale Cooper, what year is it? Remember that commercial? Yep. I can't say I do. Oh, you've never seen it? It it doesn't ring a bell. Oh, I got to find it for you. It's a great commercial. Uh, Obviously, it must have been from around 98, 99, 2000, because that was like Kerry Wood's popular era. Well, no, that was after Kerry Wood retired, so. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so it was would have been fresh off his retirement. Hey, thanks for the VIP treatment, Gary. Thanks for saving me all that money on my car insurance, Robert. That's State Farm's discount double check. We dig through your policy, find any hidden savings. That's funny. Before every home game, I used to do an Ivy double check. Really? Yeah, people drop all kinds of stuff in here. Old cell phone, French horn. Andre Dawson? What year is it? Let State Farm find your hidden savings with a discount double check. Got it! Get to a better state. State Farm. Another thing to note that this game was being played on July 10th, which was also Andre Dawson's birthday. Andre turned 36 years old in 1990. And then in his first All-Star game, was a member of the 86 Mets traded in 89 from the Mets to the rival Phillies, Lenny Dykstra. Oh, man. What more can we say about Lenny Dykstra? One of the all-time legendary characters of the sport. And oh my god, hold on a second. I gotta tell you. I've got got his lifetime averages here. 285, 81 home runs, 404 RBIs, three All-Stars, one World Series, one Silver Slugger, one arrest for bankruptcy fraud, one arrest for Grand Theft Auto and drug possession, and one arrest for indecent exposure. All told, he served six and a half months in club fed. So maybe we shouldn't talk about Lenny Dykstra after this. We don't talk about... Uh, No, no, no. I want to share this one story, okay? Okay. My brother went to a book signing for Lenny Dykstra's book, and he got it signed. But my brother said to Lenny, you know what? I'm really enjoying your Twitter account. And his agent was, like, right behind him on the phone. He was, I'll give, show you the reaction. You won't see this, but he's behind right here. And he hears my brother say that, and he just turns around like this. 
<laughs> she just shook his head, looked right back, and then just went back on the phone. But I'm telling you, it is one of my it's one of my prized possessions. It's right next to uh I also have Daryl Strawberry's book autograph too. So I have two members of the 86 Mets autograph books right in my collection right there. And I also have a David Wright autograph book too. So all right, so oh another former Met, the 1989 National League most valuable player, Kevin Mitchell from the San Francisco Giants in his second all-star game. And Kevin Another Mitchell legend from the late 80s and early 90s. Oh, yeah. 89. What a year he had getting the Giants to the series. And obviously still riding high off that because he was voted in for the 90 All-Star game. But OK, those are the starters. Now let's talk about the pitchers from the American League. We got from the Boston Red Sox in his third All-Star game, Roger Clemens. And he was just starting out becoming legendary too. So, yeah, because he would have uh, he would have had what two Cy Youngs at this time, eighty six, eighty eight, I yep. think. Two of ultimately seven. That's right, seven uh, Cy Youngs. Of course, one I think he won three with Boston. He got two with Toronto. Both years he was with Toronto. He got one with the Yankees and he got one with Houston. Right. I know he won one with the Astros, I believe. So it might have been 04. So I know he won two World Series, both as a Yankee. Yes. Next we got from the Oakland A's in his fourth All Star appearance, Dennis Eckersley. And talk about a guy who changed baseball. He perfected the one inning save. I don't even think the one inning save was like a thing in baseball. Until Tony Arusa started doing that with Dennis Eckersley around '87. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember he was a starter for like the first half of his career. Yeah, in fact, when the Mets won the Eastern Division in '86 against the Cubs, he was the starting pitcher for the Cubs that game, and he was a starter early in his career with the Red Sox. And I know he was on the 78 team with Boston, so he would have been a starter for like a good decade until he became a relief pitcher. Well, let's go even further back because he started as a starter in Cleveland in 75. Oh, OK, mm-hmm. so and, and he had a no hitter, I believe, in, in 77. Oh, that's right. He did throw a no hitter. Yeah, yeah, he did. And he would be a future, of course, MVP in uh, 92 for the American League for the A's. And, of course, one of the all-time legendary closers, along with uh, Mariano Rivera. They're probably like the two people you think of when you think of the closer. So, there you go. In his second All-Star Game appearance, oh, from the California Angels, Chuck Finley. Now, go ahead, Mike, say it. What, that he's the ex-husband of Tony Katane? Yes! <laughs> He is. He got yeah. his butt kicked by her. Oh, yeah. He, he, he totally got his ass kicked by Tawny Katane. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That would have been a great episode of the grudge match. Chuck Finley against Tawny Katane. Chuck Finley would have got his butt handed to him. Oh, I thought you were going to say that would be a great episode of Hollywood Babylon. <laughs> Hold on. His, uh, oh, no. Tony Curtis, what happens when an all-star baseball hero gets wrapped up with a video vixen? All those rock and roll stars all around her. All that Hollywood poison in its veins. It could only end in tragedy. I'm Tony Curtis. I'm Tony Curtis. Tonight we'll be talking about... The 1990 Major League Baseball All-Star Game and Chuck Finley. <laughs> Chuck Finley, he got his ass kicked by Tony Katane. I guess Curtis. he wasn't his cherry pie. Put a smile <laughs> on your face 10 miles away. I'm Tony Curtis. Oh my gosh. We've created a monster. Oh, but hold on a second, guys. 
making his all-star game debut from the Seattle Mariners. The big unit, Randy Johnson. Uh, big unit. And you yeah. know what? <laughs> he killed a bird. He did. And he would have been traded to Seattle uh, from Montreal the year earlier. That's right, 89. So yeah. this is the beginning of Randy Johnson becoming and, a star. And we're, I'm going to make a second reference to the 1989 Upper Deck series because his rookie card is in that set as well. Not card two, but I think it was like a, a single digit card because like the first, I want to say 25 rookies or 25 cards in that set were all rookies. He's somewhere in the mix there. Okay, that's good. Okay. Now from Cleveland in his third All-Star game, this isn't the future senator, and it's certainly not Kyle McLaughlin on Twin Peaks, Doug Jones. Oh, we love him here in Cleveland. He just passed away uh, late last year. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, November. Oh, man. Yeah. And uh, he was actually at uh, a, a, an Indians game pre-COVID uh, signing autographs. Great guy. One of my favorite players. Had the sweetest friggin' mustache. This big, thick handlebar mustache. Oh. And he was, let's say, Eckersley light. He, he was a good closer. No one's better than Eckersley. But he was up on that echelon. He, he was in that stratosphere. From the Baltimore Orioles in his first All-Star game, Greg Olson. Obviously not the catcher from the Braves. And obviously not the uh, current uh, color comment, the current analyst on Fox, former Carolina Panther. No, Greg Olson was a hot commodity. He was a great reliever back in 90. That was actually one commonality about a lot of these pitchers we're going to talk about, especially on the AL team. Ton of great relievers in 1990. That's right. We talked about Eckersley. We talked about Doug Jones, Greg Olson. There's one more big name coming up. Not big in the history of baseball, but big in 1990. Oh, yeah. We'll get He's coming that. up uh, right now, I think. Pretty soon, but... But yeah, Greg Olson would have been the rookie of the year in the American League in 89, so. All right, but in his second All-Star game appearance, very surprising that this is only his second All-Star game. From the Kansas City Royals, Brett Saberhagen. 1985 World Series MVP for the Royals, uh, future New York Met. Two-time Cy Young Award winner at this point. Yeah, so it's very surprising that this would only be his second All-Star game appearance. And taking a look at his stats, here is the ultimate irony of all this. He won the Cy Young in 85 and 89. He was not an all-star either of those years. What? His all-star year was 87. Uh, Well, let me see. 85 would have been Sparky Anderson, and 89 would have been... Well, it would have been La Russa, because La Russa would have been, would have been La Russa, yeah. Because the Dodgers beat the A's in 88 in the series. So, well, this time, he got his opportunity. So, good on him. And Brett Saberhagen delivered pizzas during the 1994 strike. I don't care what anybody says. This has got to be the worst job in the world. <laughs> no, I've got the worst job in the world. <laughs> Kelly, it's Brett Saberhagen. Well, then why does his name tag say Bobby Bonilla? <laughs> he called in sick. <laughs> hey, Saberhagen, is that your pizza truck in the red zone? Come on, Tarbo. If I don't get this pizza here in 30 minutes, they'll take it out of my check. At least you get a check. I get paid in mall dollars. <laughs> In his seventh All-Star game appearance from the Toronto Blue Jays, Dave Steed. One of the Blue Jays legends. Yes. Seriously, a heck of a pitcher. And true story, this is from, I believe, 1990. One of my classes went to uh, the old Cleveland Stadium to do uh, concession stands, uh, sales to, uh, to, to raise money for whatever. And I sort of ducked out for about 10, 15 minutes. 
and saw Dave Steeb throwing warm up, and I had uh, like a baseball card hoping to get an autograph. D- didn't get one. Two days later, he threw a no no against the Indians. Ooh. Ooh. But still, Dave Steeb is a legend, especially in Toronto. Yes. From the Chicago White Sox in his first All Star game. And this man had a great year in 1990. Bobby Thigpen. Really, this is like his only year. Not even joking about that. Yeah. I, I mean, he had 57 saves, which is the record at that point. But his career sort of tailed off after that. I think it held until like a couple years ago, because I think Edwin Diaz in his last year with the Mariners, I think, broke it. I think that's, I think no, that was no, Edwin Diaz. He broke it in 2008, uh, ultimately. By Francisco Rodriguez with 62. But Edwin Diaz, I think that was his only full season with Seattle before he got traded to the Mets. Yeah, in the Cano trade, yeah. Right. I think Diaz probably had like 58 or 59. So, yeah, I do remember K-Rod had 62 in uh, 08. I forgot about that. But, okay, those are the American League pitchers. So now let's go to the National League side. From the San Francisco Giants, we have Jeff Brantley. And he would just, his career just would have just been started. So, well, also it's 90, as I mentioned with Kevin Mitchell, we're a year removed from the Giants winning the pennant in 89. So, obviously, if Roger Craig managing, he's going to get one to get some of his guys on the roster. But okay, from the Cincinnati Reds. One of the nasty boys, Rob Dibble. I think it was the nastiest of the nasty boys. Oh, he was definitely the nastiest of the nasty boys. Well, uh, I mean that both from an attitude standpoint, but also he threw the the, the fiercest pitches. He he had an arm on him. He did. Oh, yeah. He, uh, he ended up uh, winning the NLCS MVP in 1990. Along with the other nasty boy, Randy Myers. That's right. Randy Myers, in his first All-Star game with the Cincinnati Reds, would have been just traded for the man we're about to talk about right now for the New York Mets in his fourth All-Star game appearance, John Franco. And really, John Franco, this is his first year with the Mets. He would have been with the Mets for like 15 years. From 90 to 04. So he would have been at the tail end of the Daryl Strawberry era. And right at the very start of the David Wright, Jose Reyes era. That tells you a lot about his longevity with the Mets. And of course, actually, as you all probably know, or may not know, I do statistics for a um, summer collegiate baseball league out in the Hamptons. And John's son actually played here out in Sag Harbor for about three seasons, and he came to all of his games and got to beat him. Very nice guy, John Franco, and I got his autograph. And really, one of the great New York bets of all time, especially 2000 NLDS game two, struck out Barry Bonds looking to end it in the 10th inning. One of my all time favorite moments as a Mets fan, striking out Bonds in that pressure packed game where Armando Benitez blew that lead in the ninth inning, giving up the home run. I believe it was uh, JT snow and the Mets scored a run in the 10th and they got the victory in the bottom of the inning. It was so great. Bonds waiting, choking up on the bat from the left side. Miller set to run three, two pitch on the inside corner. Strike three call. The ball game is over. Franco strikes out Barry Bonds with a three, two off speed pitch. And the Mets have won the ball game. And they're all out to congratulate John Franco. The Mets have tied up the series with a 10-inning victory here at Pac Bell Park. And they'll go back to Shea Stadium, tied with the Giants at a game apiece. And, Bob, what a tremendous victory oh, for the New York Mets. What a marvelous thing for John Franco. John Franco has been so unselfish all year long, working behind Armando Benitez. Coming up and it comes down to a duel with Barry Bonds. They have dueled each other so many times over the years, and Franco wins the war. Well, speaking of people in my travels, 
from the Pittsburgh Pirates in his first All-Star game. Neil Heaton. Of course, Neil Heaton is a local out here in Long Island. And actually, he was the manager for two seasons in the Collegiate Baseball League I work with for uh, the uh, what was initially called the Long Island Road Warriors. Now it's the South Shore Clippers. But he was the manager of the team for the first two seasons. And um, they won the league championship back in 2017. And actually, he trained um, a bunch of uh, pitchers out here that ended up becoming major leaguers early on when they were getting started. Um, two pitchers by the name of Marcus Strobin and Steven Matz. They've gone on to have some good careers. Yeah, they, they did well for the Mets and other teams. Yeah. And um, from the Montreal Expos in his first All-Star game, we have Dennis Martinez. I cannot believe this is his first All-Star game. No. Yep. Well, but I mean, he's been around for a long time. I mean, he started his major league career in 1976, so this is his 15th year. But also, one thing to remember about Dennis Martinez, besides the perfect game he threw uh, in 1991, at least up until a few years ago, he was the winningest Latino baseball player in Major League Baseball history. Yeah. The person who surpassed him is as Bartolo Colon, but he has like 245, 246 wins. Yeah, that that's second all time among Hispanic baseball players. That's right. But you know what? Dennis Martinez doesn't have a legendary moment like Big Bart did in San Diego that one time. No, but he can say that he was the first Nicaraguan ever to play in the majors. Yes. And also, I met him, so that's the highlight of his life right there, meeting me. Of course. Okay, from the Los Angeles Naturally! Dodgers, from the Los Angeles Dodgers, in his first All-Star game, Ramon Martinez. Yes, the older brother of Pedro Martinez. Yeah, and he threw a no-hitter, I believe, for the Dodgers, right? If I'm not mistaken. Pretty sure he did. Because I think 90 or 91 was a year that I think there were like seven or eight no-hitters. So I wouldn't be surprised if he had one of them. All right. From the Houston Astros in his second All-Star game, Dave Smith. Another guy that Who? was around for a long time. Well, he was on the 86 NLCS team that played against the Mets, Dave Smith. He actually gave up the uh, home run in game three to Lenny Dykstra. So okay, no, 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 now that I see his picture, okay, I know who you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, no longer with us. Died of a heart attack in 2008. Oh, that's that sucks. And last but not least, we talked about him plenty of times from the New York Mets in his second All Star game. Frank Viola. Ah, oh, sweet music. The 1987 World Series MVP for the Twins would have been traded to the Mets in 89 around the deadline. And, well, we talked about that classic pitching duel in the 1981 NCAA tournament when he was with St. John's when he pitched against a young kid from Yale University by the name of Ron Darling. And actually, I believe uh, him and John Franco were teammates at St. John's too, so... Teammates at St. John's, teammates on the Mets, and teammates in the uh, All-Star game in 1990. So, there you go. All right, now we go to the reserves. This is going to be the fun part here of all this, the reserves. Yep, and all of these people, you know, some of them would just be start like a great majority of them would just be starting out. Some wouldn't be on the tail end of their careers, but they're all pretty much, you're going to hear their name and say, that guy. That guy. Okay, starting with the California Angels, the catcher, and its eighth All-Star game, Lance Parrish. Of course, uh, with the Tigers, I believe, he was on the 84 team. I was going to say, I'm surprised that he was with the Angels at this point because he spent a long time with the Tigers. Oh, yeah. How long would he have been with the Angels, I'm wondering? Taking a look, it looks like uh, about four years. Four three years. And a half year, about three and a half years. Yeah, because he would have spent two years with the Phillies, 
uh, would have been traded to Seattle in 92, played in Cleveland in 93, Pittsburgh 94, Toronto in 95. So, And actually is still is a um, manager now in the Detroit Tigers system. He is the manager. I think the affiliate is the uh, West Michigan Whitecaps. Okay. Because they, they uh, are in the same league as uh, the local minor league team, the Lake County Captains, and uh, and I've seen him sign autographs at games. Okay. But, oh, in his first All-Star game from the Detroit Tigers. First of many. Cecil Fielder. And you got to remember, this is his breakout year because he was with Toronto back in, like, 86, went to Japan for a couple of years, and then Detroit signed him in 1990, and that's when he became a superstar because he hit, like, 51 homers. Oh, man. He was, like... I think he finished second in the MVP voting behind Ricky, but 1990 was his breakout year. He would just hit bombs that you would just talk about and be like, you'd just be in awe every time you would hit a home run off the end of the bat. Just incredible. But okay, in his second All Star game from the Texas Rangers, and I think he would have been a young 45 years old at this time. Julio Franco. Uh, he would actually have been 32. He would have been that, 32. That's the joke. That's the joke. Yeah. Uh, uh, because in, in case anybody doesn't know, uh, Julio Franco played forever. Not yeah, even he, joking when I say that. He was on the Mets team in 06. He was primarily used as a pinch hitter with the Mets back in 06. And he would have been like 48 at that point with the Mets. Something like and, that. And do, you, and do you remember he was still playing? I don't think he was playing in Japan, but he was still playing pro ball up until I want to say about two or three years ago. Yeah. He was like 58, 59 years old. Yeah, right now he's coaching in Korea. Oh, that's great. He's in the KBO. Mm-hmm. Surprised he's not playing for the KBO right now. He probably could. He probably wants to. He could be a player manager at like 65 or whatever, how old he is now. Just a young 63. Oh, well. Okay. From the Toronto Blue Jays at third base, his second All-Star game, Kelly Gruber. Underappreciated player from the 80s and 90s. Yep. 274, 31 homers, 118 RBIs. 14 stolen bases, gold glove, silver slugger, fourth in the ballot that year. Fourth. Ooh. Former Indians prospect. From Cleveland in his second All-Star game at third base, Brooke Jacoby. He's one of the really appreciated players here from that time. Not not a big name, obviously. Not going to the Hall of Fame anytime soon. But he was a, a very reliable third baseman the Cleveland team back in the late 80s and early 90s. All right. In his second All-Star game at shortstop from the Chicago White Sox and got a great ovation from the White Sox fans in the crowd. Oh, yeah. Ozzie Guillen. Thanks. From the Chicago White Sox, number 13, Ozzie Guillen. And, of course, Ozzie Guillen, 15 years later after this, would win the Chicago White Sox first championship since 1917 as a manager in 2005. And really one of the all-time entertaining characters in the sport, Ozzie Guillen. Yeah, especially in his uh, season in Miami. Oh, God, that was just... In 2012? Oh, what a train wreck that was. That was was a show. It was so bad, Jose Reyes said, get me the F out of here. Yeah, right? Trade me to Toronto. I don't care. I don't want to be here anymore. I should have stayed with the Mets. Right? In his sixth All-Star game from the Detroit Tigers, future Hall of Famer Alan Trammell. Him and Lou Whitaker, what can you say? That's right. And they played forever. I mean, I think they were teammates as rookies back in, I want to say, 77. 
And I know that they were playing at least up until 93, 94 together. So you're talking about 17 years with the same two people at shortstop and second base. Yeah, you don't ever see that. You'll never see that again. Never. No. Unless you're the Yankees, you'll never see that again. Let's go into the reserve outfielders. Okay, first, from the Toronto Blue Jays, in his second All-Star Game appearance, George Bell. 1987 American League MVP. And actually, his son actually played for the collegiate league I work with back in um, 2017 in Riverhead. He actually, believe it or not, was the All-Star Game MVP, George Bell's son, in 2017. And actually, now today, his son actually is playing in the independent Can-Am League for the New Jersey Jackals. But George Bell, senior, wow. 1987, 50 home runs, I believe, for Toronto. And, well, he was like one of the bright spots from those Blue Jays teams back in the 80s. In his first All-Star game from the Boston Red Sox, Ellis Burks. This is another guy who I think played forever. Oh, he played, uh, I think, two or three seasons for uh, the Indians. And actually, kind of uh, coincidental, we talk about him right now. Uh, as of the time that we're recording this, he's actually at the Cleveland Zoo at the Asian Lantern Festival signing autographs. Not what? even joking. Not even joking. Not even joking about that? The Guardians put on their social media that today and I think it's uh, like next uh, sometime next weekend, I believe, or two weekends from now, that uh, certain Cleveland legends are going to be signing autographs uh, around town. And tonight was Ellis Burks and I forget who else. Some, oh, Mike Hargrove was tonight, oh, I okay. believe. Oh, that's and, great. And, and then in two weeks was going to be um, uh, Len Barker and uh, Joe Charbonneau. So oh. just and, and I actually was thinking about bailing out of the, the recording for tonight to get Ellis Burks' autograph because of the four players, he's the only one I don't have. Oh, oh. But I but I stuck around. Well, that's great. Okay, from the Minnesota Twins in his fifth All Star game. Now batting Kirby Puckett. Oh God, this guy! What hasn't he done? We're talking about um, ten All Star games, two World Series titles, the ALCS MVP. One year later from now, and one year later would have one of the most memorable games in the history of the World Series with his amazing catch in Game Six against Atlanta and the walk off home run. To win that game. And doppelganger of Chico Alexander. Doppelganger of Chico Alexander. That is correct. I was told I look like a combination of Kobe Bryant, Kirby Puckett, and Shamar Moore. That is not a pretty picture, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, two of the three I can see. Shamar Moore? Okay. No. And from the Milwaukee Brewers in his seventh all-Star Game appearance, and I can't believe he was still in the league in 1990, Dave Parker. But Dave Parker had one of the most memorable moments in the history of the All-Star Game in 1979 in Seattle as a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates when he just gunned down a runner at home plate from the uh, warning track. And made the most perfect throw to Gary Carter to get the out. One of the most legendary throws you'll ever see. Line drive, right field. We may have a play at the plate. Big hop. Here comes Downing. Here's a throw. It is. He knocked him off the plate. What a time by Carter. A tremendous play by Carter. Oh, baby, what a play. And what a throw by Dave Parker, who continues to show why some people consider him the greatest player. Great play by Carter, as you said, Joe. A strong throw. Downing tries to slide inside, away from the ball. Carter blocks him off. He knocked him right off the plate, never did let him in. How Carter was able to catch that ball. 
Now, he, he cuts loose with the ball, but now watch Carter knock the runner off the plate. Right there, he pushes him off, almost gets in there. Look at his hand. Tremendous work by our crew. And Carter comes up with the ball, and he had a good ball to handle, Tony. Indeed. Uh, ultimately, though, he was traded at the end of 1990 to the Angels for Dante Bichette. I only point this out because I had a circular uh, bread loaf card of Dave Parker and a Don Russ 1990 card of Dante Bichette. Of course, this would be years before he went to the Colorado Rockies in the expansion draft. Correct. Before he became like a legend with those tees with uh, Vinny Castilla and Andres Galarraga. Larry and Walker. Larry Walker, Todd Elton. All right, but now let's go to the National League where, oh, we have the other Greg Olson from Atlanta who's catching. But mm -hmm. here's the difference between him and the Baltimore Greg Olson. This Greg Olson has just one G. No, one Greg Olson has three Gs. This guy. I mean, has at the G's. end of his name. There you go. But again, still not good guy, Greg, formerly of the Carolina Panthers. From the San Diego Padres in his second All Star game, Benito Santiago. The greatest player ever to wear number 09. Nice. I said zero nine. Same thing. Zero nine six nine. That it makes all, absolutely no sense. It anyway. all ends at nine. Okay, going over to second base, we have from the San Diego Padres. It is first All Star appearance. Roberto Alomar. Hold on, I'm 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 trying to hawk a loogie right now. <laughs> oh, now that's a bad joke at Robert, about Roberto Alomar. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but seriously, that's what he's best known for. I mean, other than some other things we don't want to talk about, but that's what he's best known for. Yeah, he's he's the the less evil of the Alomar brothers. I'm sorry, the evil Alomar brother. Sandy Alomar Jr. is just an amazing person. We don't talk about Roberto Almore. No, no, no. Okay. From the Montreal Expos, it is fifth All-Star game appearance. Tim Wallach. This is actually his final All-Star game. Uh, he played in 161 games. He hit 296, 37 doubles, 21 home runs, 98 RBIs, and the gold glove for the third and final time. And at third base from the San Francisco Giants in his first All-Star game appearance, Matt Williams. He'd be on some of the legendary San Francisco Giants teams later in the decade. In the 90s? Yeah, it wasn't he? He was with the Giants for a long time, wasn't he? He was with uh, Cleveland in 97. Oh, well, yeah, he was, he... In, he was with the Giants in the 80s. Okay, I thought he was with the 93 team. He didn't come to Cleveland until 97, but he only spent one year here and and is beloved. Yeah, well, I was thinking about the 93 team that, uh, well, came up short against Atlanta. Maybe one of the best teams that didn't make it to the uh, playoffs ever, that 93 team with Bonds. Didn't he win a title with Arizona in 01? He did win a title with Arizona in 01. So, okay, he did eventually get his championship, so. Yes, he did. Also, I'm surprised he's not in the Hall of Fame, given his numbers, at least looking at home run numbers, 378. I mean, he didn't have that many hits. He had under 2,000 hits, but you, you can't ignore almost 400 homers. From the Chicago Cubs in his second All-Star game, Sean Dunstan. Hometown hero. We said this was played at Wrigley. Yeah. And um, let me just see. He was with the Cubs a long time. He was with them from 85 to 95, went with the Giants in 96, came back to the Cubs in 97, went to Pittsburgh in 97, was with Cleveland and San Francisco in 98, the Cardinals and Mets in 99, back with the Cardinals in 2000. His last season would have been the 02 Giants team that went to the World Series, but he has one of the most legendary at-bats in New York Mets history in Game 5 of the 99 NLCS in the 15th inning, where he had, like, a 15-pitch at-bat leading off 
and he got on base. And that eventually led to the classic Robin Ventura Grand Slam single from the Cincinnati Reds in his third All-Star Game appearance. Barry Larkin. Hall of Famer Barry Larkin. And, of course, this was 1990, the year the Cincinnati Reds just became a sensation, wire to wire, winning the championship. But Barry Larkin, a long and amazing career, all with the Cincinnati Reds. First shortstop to join the 30-30 club. Yes. Now we're going to go with a pair of Pittsburgh Pirates here. First, making his debut All-Star game, Barry Bonds. And really, you all know about Barry Bonds. We're not going to go up in length about him. You all know who Barry Bonds is. Making his third All-Star game appearance, Bobby Bonilla from the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> Bobby Bonilla Day. <laughs> oh. The most overrated thing where New York sports writers just jerk themselves off. Where they try to pretend that deferred payments don't happen all the time in baseball. When freaking Bruce Suter just got his eight million dollar balloon payment from atlanta that just happened bruce Suter he, he's got, wrong. got an eight million dollar balloon payment to finish out a contract he signed when i was one year old think about how pathetic that is he's not wrong from the san diego padres in his sixth all-star game the late great Tony Gwynn. Yep, we talked about early Banks being Mr. Cub. Tony Gwynn was Mr. Padre. Yeah. And really one of the all-time legendary hitters in the sport. And fortunately, we lost him. How long has it been since we lost Tony? Eight years. Really? Yes. Wow. He was, I think, the head coach at one point at San Diego State, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, Yep. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And he played baseball and I th- and basketball, I think, at San Diego State. Yeah. Because so. he got drafted, I think, by the San Diego Cl- uh, Clippers. Oh, yeah. Wow. So he got drafted by both the Padres and the Clippers. Yeah. That is amazing. OK. And then finally, in his seventh All-Star Game appearance, in his final season with the New York Mets, Daryl. Strawberry. And if you don't know who Daryl Strawberry is, really, just come on. We maybe mentioned you should, maybe we should go listen to a, a hockey podcast or something. Well, we mentioned the Simpsons episode. Every Simpsons fan knows who he is. Yeah, the game is not really like remembered for much, but there was a big rain delay. Now, this is the reason why we're bringing this up. In the top of the seventh inning, there was a rain delay that went a long time, where I think it might have been, what, an hour and a half, two hours, the rain delay? Let's just say it was long enough to fit an entire episode of something that that would take an hour, maybe 90 minutes. Maybe a half hour. Maybe a half hour. At maybe most. an hour. Who knows? We're not hinting towards something. No. But it was long enough. It was a long rain delay, but I think there's an interview, I think, with uh, Faye Vincent, who was the commissioner of baseball at the time, and said, well, we're not going to call this game. We owe it to the fans of Chicago to finish this game. Andre Dawson of the Chicago Cubs. Let's take it out now to Pat O'Brien, who has a, a very special guest with him, Patrick. All right, Jack, thank you. I'm in the American League dugout with uh, Commissioner Faye Vincent, who's enjoying a cup of coffee. We're keeping dry down here. What about this? What are you going to do? Well, I'm told that uh, they expect it to let up in about an hour from when it, uh, we, we uh, postponed or at least put the tarp out. So we'll wait the hour and see what happens. If it had been a score now. It's an official game now. Would you, would you stop the game now? Is that the idea no, that you don't have a score? I think we always wait. I think we owe it to the fans. We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't call it this quickly. We'll wait, see if we can finish it. You like hanging around the dugout anyway, right? Talking to a great pitcher about his no-hitter, sure, Randy Johnson. 
Back up to Jack. See you, fellas. And sure enough, after about an hour and a half, two hours, they resumed play. And guess who came through for the American League in the top of the seventh inning? Julio Franco hit a two-run double. Meanwhile, base hit puts the American League on top. It goes deep, and the second run might also score. Harris not a good runner, but he is going to be able to dent the plate. And it's two to nothing in favor of the American League as Franco came through on an 0-2 count. When you add up all the elements, there is no way for Julio Franco to pull a ball off a guy like Dibble who throws so hard. But Dibble makes the mistake of finding too much of the plate, and Franco rifles one in the right center. Strawberry misses the first cutoff man. He does find Sean Dunstan, but Parrish ends up walking home. See how far Franco has to go with that bat to come back, that loop in his swing, a mistake by Dibble. And was named the game's most valuable player because that was the only scoring in this game as Dennis Eckersley threw a scoreless ninth inning as the American League won two to nothing. And the American League, the pitching, just dominated the National League. Two hits total in the All-Star game. And if I can look at the box score, let me just see who got the two hits for the National League real quick. I got it. Lenny Dykstra and Will Clark. Okay. So that's pretty good. I mean, not good for the... I mean, the American League just dominated him, but it's good that they got a hit at least, Lenny Dykstra and Will Clark. One other thing to note, guys, is the American League nearly scored three runs in the top of the seventh. However, in this clip we are about to play, Daryl Strawberry made this strong throw at the plate to get Julio Franco out to end the inning. Second and third one out, and a fly ball might drop. No, it carries out to the right fielder, a tag, and a throw by Strawberry at the plate. He is out on the most exciting play of the All-Star game. And it ends the inning. A great throw by Strawberry. And Sosha's one of the best at making the tag. Two runs, three hits, and one man left. Some throw. Also afterwards, Harry Carey sang Take Me Out to the Bowl Game because how can you not have an all-star game at Wrigley without him singing the song? Oh, my God. Do you know who sang the national anthem at the all-star game? Richard Marks. Richard Marks. Well, if they were looking for another talent, well, I'll tell you what, the bookers should have known better. Oh. Uh, Get it? Greg, that joke don't mean nothing. <laughs> I get it because he's saying it don't mean nothing. <laughs> well, well, if anyone needs any more jokes, I'll be right here waiting. So. <laughs> Oh, gosh. No. Stop. No. I've run out of Richard Marks related puns anyway. Well, Julio Franco came through. Old ass and all to give us a two run double and give the American League the win in what was, I believe, their third straight all-star victory. And that would be a streak that lasted until I believe 93 because the national league had a streak where they won three straight from 94 to 96. And then the American league had a 13 game unbeaten streak from um, 97 to 09. Cause I said unbeaten. Cause remember the tie in 02. Oh, who could forget the uh, tie in 0-2? Oh, God. Yeah. That was five hours of my life I'll never get back. And then I think the National League had a streak of three in a row from 10 to 12, and I think it's been the American League since 2013. So who knows what's going to happen this year in L.A., considering that this is going to be the first All-Star game with the Universal DH. So... That should no longer be a problem for the National League, I don't think. Although I think it's been like, what, the All-Star game has been a permanent DH for a couple of years now. 
I don't think we want to see AL pitchers bat. No, I do for comedy. But for, well, for comedy, yeah, but in, in terms of actual productivity, no. Didn't Charles Nagy have a hit in the All Star game in '92? I want to say he did. I do remember. I think I do remember this. Charles Nagy had a hit in the 1992 All-Star game at the Murph. But guys, what can we say about the 1990 MLB All-Star game? It had everything from an epic story at the beginning to a rain delay in the middle to an after midnight ending. And uh, am I missing anything, Mike? You're missing that we had an absolute ton of Hall of Fame talent. And, and we're talking about starting with just at the top, Griffey and uh, Wade Boggs, and just going down the roster, like so many Hall of Famers, or could be Hall of Famers with asterisks for certain people that we won't talk about. We don't talk about Roger Clemens or Barry Bonds. Or Roberto Alomar. Well, he didn't do any steroids, but yeah. I'm talking about the other things Roberto Alomar. I know, I know, I know, I know, but he he didn't inject anything. I know, but still. He's not a good person. No, he's not a he's not a good man. He's a bad man. But still, all this talent, little scoring, a lot of good pitching, a long rain delay. And that gave us a combination, which turned out to be a memorable thing on TV. Yep. But guys, how would you like to own a piece to remember the 1990 All-Star Game by? I would like that very much. Okay. Let's play eBay Price is Right. But of course. say so. Okay, guys, you are going to be bidding on a 1990 MLB All-Star Game, Wrigley Field, Chicago Cubs, tin, garbage can. What? (laughs) What? (laughs) What? Okay, we need to see pictures, I think. I'm sending you the picture in the chat. I want to see a picture of this. That is a Chicago 19... Now, this, now, to be fair, this was marketed for the All-Star Game, but it was not used at Wrigley, right? No, this is like one of those garbage cans you see at, like, a store or something. This is like a Walmart garbage can. Something that you'd see at, like, Kmart or Montgomery Ward or whatever. Or yeah, Sears, that's what I don't know. That's what I thought. Okay. Ooh, look at that. Turn it over on the bottom. It says, endorsed by Jose Altuve 2017. (laughs) Oh, please, Brian Cashman. Brian Cashman, shut up. Nobody asked you. Your team sucked that year, and you weren't going to be the better than the Dodgers that year anyway. So, okay. So here's the description. Rare 1990 MLB All-Star Game Wrigley Field Chicago Cubs P and K 19 inch tin garbage can. Excellent condition, never used, has been in storage. So, Chico, I'm going to start the bid with you. Well, if it's one of those Walmart cans, I think it's like, I think we're looking at uh, $39. Mike? Oh, no. Those things, I, I think, are a lot less. <laughs> I think 39 is too much. I'm going to undercut Chico. I'm going to go $15. Guys? Oh, gosh, it's $200. Gee whiz. $199. You're getting fleeced, man. You are getting fleeced. I'm sorry. That's just the truth. You're getting fleeced. You know what fleeced is? You. Greg, I'm sorry. You, you, that's like your biggest tell. Whenever you say guys, 
it's like, oh crap, it's two hundred dollars. It's like five times more expensive than either of us thought it would be. How have you not figured out how I'm gonna play this game? How? Well, no, like I said, your tell is guys. It's like, oh no, that this you know piece of lint goes for like five thousand dollars. Who cares about the lint? Just saying, just an example. You could bid. Hey, it's Benita Santiago's belly button lint from the All Star Game, two thousand dollars. But what can we say? As we said, this game, it took forever with the rain delay, but ultimately it got completed, and it ended up becoming for CBS in that dream season of 1990, a thing on TV. One thing I want to note before we sign off for this episode is this game actually re-aired recently in the Chicago land area back in 2020 around when the COVID-19 pandemic forced the cancellation of a lot of uh, sporting events that year. This actually re-aired in Chicago on the Marquee Sports Network, which is the regional sports network that is the home of the Chicago Cubs. So this game actually did re-air as recently as 2022 20, years ago well that's going to do it for this episode but you can listen to the 286 episodes that preceded this at it was a thing on tv.com we can find all sorts of fun stuff we got bonuses live shows minisodes directors cuts remasters of old episodes and of course we are on youtube and if you're at youtube don't forget to Ring the bell Holy cow. to stay up to date on future episodes, including the one we have coming up on Thursday. Now, we purposely didn't mention what happened during the rain delay. And there's a reason why. But that will be on our next episode right here on It Was a Thing on TV. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you with what happened during that rain delay on Thursday. Wow! Listen, I gotta go now. Uh-huh. I'm getting dinner at Patsy's with Frank Crosetti and <laughs> Phil Rizzuto. <laughs> the money store. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like to start with a nice antipasto uh-huh. salad. Mm-hmm. It has lettuce, right. onion, sure. olives, olives, artichoke, and olives. Olives, right. And then I wash it down with a nice, cool Budweiser. All right, great. Budweiser, the king of beer. Uh-huh, that's yeah. right. Hey, hit me with a little organ, Paul. A little organ, Paul. Let me root, root, root for the cubbies if they Harry, don't Harry.